One of KSP's classic challenges is the three-part challenge, where the goal is to go as far as you can with only three parts. For those of you who don't know, back in the olden days of KSP, Scott Manley published a video where he used a three-part rocket to go to Mimis and back. Another Kerbonaut, Matthew Carr, followed up with a three-part mission to the moon and back, where he came up with a very creative way to stage the top tank by colliding it with the moon. Later on, Hazardish used this technique to send a three-part mission to Gillian back. And, of course, in response to this, I made my own fully reusable three-part mission to Gilly. Inspired by these videos, I decided to take on the challenge again and see just how far I could push three parts. After some more experimentation, I came up with some new tricks to accomplish this. Today, we are going to Duna, Ike, and Minmus with just three parts. By the way, if you haven't seen any of these videos, I highly recommend you check them out. These talented Kerbonauts have really inspired this mission, and this video would not exist without their contributions to the challenge. Alright, here's my new design. At first glance, it has a lot in common with previous three-part missions. It has a twin bore, a 3.75 meter tank, and a command pod. However, there's a few tricks I've employed to push these three parts further than before. Let's launch this thing, and I'll show you what I've come up with. The launch profile has to be fairly precise. So to make my launches more consistent, I created a simple gravity turn procedure. The first step is to immediately pitch over to 5 degrees from vertical and then hold that orientation with SAS. On reaching 80 meters per second, I switch the autopilot to prograde. These two fairly simple steps set up a nice gravity turn fairly consistently. While we wait for the gravity turn to complete, let me explain my first trick. To reduce drag as much as possible, I attached everything in line as shown here and then rotated the lander can 180 degrees. Then I offset the command pod to the bottom of the twin bore and offset the fuel tank to the top. By doing this odd looking series of transformations, I significantly reduced the drag of the craft. The reason why this works is because KSP doesn't calculate drag based on the shape of the craft, but rather what nodes are occupied or not. An occupied node produces much less drag than an unoccupied node. Additionally, an upwind facing node produces much more drag than a downwind node. For example, by rotating the lander can 180 degrees, I shift the fuel tank's unoccupied node from the upwind side to the downwind side. This in turn greatly reduces the drag. This isn't the whole story, but it should give you enough to understand what's going on here. Okay, now for the next trick. As in previous three-part missions, we want to stage the top tank in order to get more delta V. However, while previous attempts used collision with a moon to stage the tank, I'm going to use aerodynamic heating to destroy the tank. This is why the launch profile needs to be precise. Too shallow, and the tank will be destroyed without burning all of its fuel. Too steep, and it won't be melted at all. As you can see by this run, I got it pretty close to the ideal profile. Soon after all the fuel is burned, the aero heating destroyed the tank. As soon as the tank melts away, we need to cut the throttle momentarily so that the twin bore isn't destroyed too. This aerodynamic heating is also why the command pod needs to be below the twin bore. The lander can itself is fairly fragile and can't handle heating as well as the twin bore. All said and done, we have about 3,200 meters per second in orbit, which is plenty to go to Duna and back. While we have a decent margin, it's a good practice to be as efficient as possible. In this case, to reduce our Duna transfer burn, we can use a moon gravity assist to save about 100 meters per second. It is important to note that a moon assist like this will only give these savings if it's lined up properly. In this case, since we want to eject to a planet in a higher orbit than Kerbin, we want the ejection angle to line up with Kerbin's forward solar velocity. Six months and a few correction burns later, we are now arriving at Duna. Of course, since Duna has an atmosphere, we are going to use it to slow down. In order to get the drag we need, we need to have the unoccupied node of the lander can facing upwind. Again, since the lander can is rotated 180 degrees, counterintuitively we have to enter backwards rather than forwards. This actually poses a small problem. Here we have high drag at the front from the lander can and relatively low drag from the twin bore. As a result, the craft is unstable and wants to flip around. Fortunately, the reaction wheels on the Landy can are enough to keep it facing backwards. We just need to be careful with the electric charge consumption going forward since we have no way of generating more charge. With the air braking done, we can enter a stable orbit and select our landing site. 
Usually, you want to land at a high elevation in order to avoid the lower atmosphere and, of course, drag losses. However, since this craft has low drag facing forwards, drag losses are not a problem here. Instead, I found it was better to land at a low elevation so that the atmosphere can slow us down as much as possible in order to reduce our landing burn. The landing itself was somewhat tricky. The craft is top heavy and likes to tip over. And to make things more difficult, we need to start the landing burn as late as possible so we can save more delta V. By sheer luck, I managed to get this landing on the first try. Although trust me, when I was testing this, I had a lot more failed attempts. We're just going to get Jeb and Valentina out, and there's our first flag of the mission. Since the drag is so low, I found it was best to take a shallow launch profile. So, we're going to tilt over to 30 degrees right away, slam the throttle, and then coast to orbit. And we arrive in orbit with about 800 meters per second of delta V. Originally, I only planned to do a Duna landing and then go home. However, we have enough Delta V to do something else. Hmm. Let's go to Ike. The Ike transfer insertion takes about 400 meters per second of Delta V, dropping us down to about 400 meters per second left. Now, the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that this is nowhere near enough to land on Ike, return to orbit, and then go home. Thus, we will need to utilize Valentina's EVA pack to land. Still, this doesn't solve the problem. The Kerbal's EVA pack still doesn't have enough delta V to land and then return to orbit. We just need some more delta V. Hmm. I think I might have something. If you've watched Danny2462 before, you might know what I'm thinking. We have this twin bore here. Let's use it as a mass driver. We're just going to carefully position Valentina's head next to the engine bell and give it a quick pulse. And wow, that's actually a lot more Delta V than I expected. We got over 300 meters per second from this stunt, which gives us plenty of margin to land and return to orbit. Since Kerbals are durable, I'm going to use Valentina's legs to absorb the landing impact. A slight discomfort is well worth the Delta V savings. And there's the second flag. Duna is looking lovely as ever on the horizon. The return to orbit is the simplest part of this ordeal. One note, since I can't create maneuver nodes for Kerbals, I try to launch when the main craft is passing overhead so I can use the target mode on the nav ball to help align my rendezvous. And with Valentina back at the ship, that's the Duna system conquered. Let's go home. To perform our ejection burn, we are going to perform a bi-ecliptic transfer to lower our Duna periapsis, and then burn at periapsis to maximize our use of the Oberth effect. A few more months and small correction burns later, we are back at Kerbin. But we are not done yet. We are one landing away from having three landings in this mission. One landing for each part we started with. So, we are going to hit up one of the easiest destinations in the game to finish this off. Minmus. As you may have noticed, we don't have much Delta V left, so we are going to have to arrow break to the correct altitude. There's really no special tricks here, I just used trial and error to find the right periapsis for this error break. And with that, our apoapsis is very close to Minmus. With a small burn at apoapsis, we can sync our orbit such that we will encounter Minmus in a few orbits from now. With the encounter setup, we will drop Jeb off right here and adjust the main craft's orbit. We want Jeb to reach Minmus first so that he can land, plant a flag, and perform at least one orbit before rendezvousing with the main craft. Okay, let's do this. For our Minmus landing, we want to land on one of the high plateaus. Same as with the Ike landing, we don't have enough Delta V to land using just the EVA pack, so we're going to have to use a trick to save some Delta V here. I'm going to shamelessly steal a trick from Bradley Wistons here and use a slight orthopedic adjustment session to shave 50 meters per second off of our landing burn. This is going to take a while, so let's speed this up. And there we are. After roughly 8 minutes of adjustment, we are ready to plant our flag and return back to the main craft. Again, getting to orbit is the simple part, so let's quickly skip through this. Once in orbit, we will have an encounter with the main craft in one orbit. We are going to catch the ship as it flies by, Mark Watney style. We are just barely going to have enough fuel to do this, but it works out. Fortunately, we don't have to do anything stupid to make up the last 10 meters per second. 
Now, all that's left is to lower our curb and periapsis, and oh. Looks like Minmus gave us a little gravity assist on the flyby, and now our periapsis is too high to lower with our remaining 6 meters per second of delta V. No worries though, we have the moon to help us out in this dire situation. With a small burn, we can adjust our orbit such that we will get a helpful moon encounter a few orbits down the line. With this moon gravity assist, we can get a nice arrow breaking periapsis. At this point, it's just a matter of waiting out the arrow breaks. On our final pass, I use the remaining electric charge to redirect our trajectory over the KSC. Once we are close, the twin bore overheats from re-entry and the lander can slows down the rest of the way due to its immense drag. At this point, all that's left is to hop out and glide with Valentina and Jeb home. Thank you for watching. Please let me know what you think of the mission as well as the quality of my voiceover. I want to keep making videos like these, so any feedback you have to improve them would be greatly appreciated. See you all next time.